Hi guys, it's Max. We're back with Battlecode 2015. In this series of videos, I'll make a player from start to finish. I'll start by making a new package in my players folder. I'll call it player1. I'll right click on the package and go to new file. It has to be called robotplayer.java. In the class robot player, I'll define a method. The method takes an argument, robot controller, and I'll give that argument the name RC. I'll import the battle code API like so. And then I'll push save. This is all you need to have a player that compiles. Here I've run ant run from Eclipse. It's the same as running it from the command line. I'll test my player 1 versus Alex test player on the map hooks. You can see that on round 0, all of my robots explode. Why does that happen? The console explains Robot A died on round 0 because its run method returned. In battle code, you never want the run method to finish. So the code is executed starting at this line, and then it reaches the end, and the robot dies. To avoid that, we'll make an infinite loop with while true. So it will just continu continually loop in these few lines. Let's look at that. Some of this stuff is pretty basic. In a while, we'll get to the other commands. Even people familiar with Java might not know why these units are using their maximum bytecode allocation. The towers have a maximum of 2,000, and the headquarters has a maximum of 1,000, whereas the enemy team is only using about 200 bytecode. The reason is that each robot needs to call rc.yield in order to finish its turn. If it doesn't do that, it will just keep looping through while true, while true. And this actually does cost some small amount of bytecode, and so the unit will hit its bytecode limit and stop execution there at the uh, end of the round. If we use rc.yield, the total number of bytecodes used is just one loop per round. When we run the player, we should see each uh, tower and the headquarters only take about three bytecode or so. And sure enough, that's what we see. The enemy is using more bytecode because they have more um, code to compute, more things. Let's put in some more things. So now we've got rc.yield. Let's start by spawning some units. First, let's check the type of the unit. If rc.getType equals robottype.hq, the headquarters is able to spawn units. Here's a quick look at the tech tree. The headquarters spawns the beaver. Then the beaver builds these other buildings. That's what we're going to start with working on. If my type is robottype.headquarters, well, then we need to try to spawn a beaver. In Battlecode, there are a few things you have to check before you do anything. This table shows what things need to be checked depending on which action you want to take. It's kind of complicated. This is posted online. So here we're trying to spawn, so we need to check is core ready and can spawn. These are the two requirements. This will increment the core delay and weapon delay of the unit that's doing the spawning. The repeatable field means that since this is not repeatable, I cannot do this multiple times in one round. So we'll check if RC dot is core ready and RC dot can spawn. I'll just pick 
the direction north and the robot type beaver. If both of those conditions are met, then I can go ahead and spawn it. This has a red underline because it can throw an action exception. I'll use surround with try catch. I want to try and catch a lot of the things that this code is going to do. So I'll move the try out here and the catch out here. The function of try catch is to catch errors and print them, e.print stack trace, to the console so that I can see them and they don't cause a fatal error. Otherwise, exceptions would cause the run method to return and the robot would explode. Okay, so now we should be able to see the unit spawn these beavers. Let's look. And sure enough, the headquarters has spawned a single beaver, and that beaver is located just north. So that's how you do spawning. If we had not included these checks, we would have gotten a lot of exceptions in the console. Each of those exceptions would have cost 500 bytecode. Let's see what that looks like. So I'll comment out the check, and we'll try to spawn independent of whether we've checked that we're ready to spawn. This may also cause the encoder for this video to chug somewhat because there's going to be a lot of text printed to the console, so the encoder is going to work really hard. You may see a lot of dropped frames. So everything looks normal, but now the headquarters is using 500 bytecodes and change. And those 500 bytecodes are coming from the penalty associated with all of these exceptions that are being thrown. Let's look at these a little bit more closely. It says, game action exception cannot move robot of given type to that location. That's kind of a, a difficult to understand message. It's not very clear. It means it's tried to spawn this robot where a robot already exists. And the game engine is effectively moving a new robot to a location that's occupied. And it throws exception. So we need these checks in there. OK. Next, let's try to make the beaver move around. The headquarters can't move. So that's why we're using the beaver to test this moving around. I'm just showing you the functions of the API. So on the face of it, we would be using rc.move and then give it a direction. I'll just choose north for now. But you can't just call move. Again, we'll consult the delays and checks table. For move, you need to check if the core is ready and if you can move. Can move takes into account the locations of other robots and of the terrain, whether it's traversable. It may also take into account whether the unit is able to move, because, for example, the headquarters is not a moving unit, and neither are any of the other buildings. So I'll check those two things. If RC dot is core ready and RC dot can move. I realize I'm typing this in the wrong place. Put that here. Cut, paste, delete, save. Now we should see the beaver move in the direction north. then the headquarters should be able to build more beavers because the other one won't be in the way. We should see a stream of them move toward the enemy and get annihilated. Here they go. All right, 100% success. In the next episode, we'll look at some other functions. And gradually, we'll build up a complete player, at least in terms of the functionality of the API. I hope this helps. Thanks for watching.